Hello and welcome to Uroro Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, up to this point, I've been doing a tutorial of Dwarf Fortress. If you've seen my first video, you'll have noticed that my intent is actually to write my own game, uh, which is heavily influenced by Dwarf Fortress. And I really wanted to do the tutorial and playthrough of Dwarf Fortress just to show the parts of the game that I really enjoy and things that have really influenced me when I write my own game. But in this channel, I also want to document some of the development techniques and that kind of thing that I intend to use uh, while writing the game. Now, I'll have to admit that, in fact, I have not written any substantial code for the game yet, and it will be a multi-year project, so I'm not really intending to release anything in the next little while. I think probably the first release will take me a good four or five thousand hours, so we're talking a few years from now before I'll actually have anything really worth playing. Uh, but I'm hoping to document some of the process as I go, and I hope you'll uh, join along and uh, watch what's happening. Now today I'm going to do something that's a bit more technical, um, and in fact there may be a lot of things that people who have been watching my videos before will watch and it'll be completely over their head, because this is going to be me programming. And I'm not really going to explain what I'm doing on the programming front for now. I think I will probably, I, I actually have this idea that I probably will go back and explain what I'm doing so that those of you who are interested in learning how to program maybe can use it as an inspiration for helping you get to that next level uh, where you can actually write code yourself. Today though I'm going to focus on a technique called the Pomodoro Technique and I have a peculiar method of using the Pomodoro Technique which I wanted to show. I don't use it all the time but I do use it sometimes. It's, it's a technique that I developed along with a colleague of mine and I'll give a shout out to uh, David Pereira. We worked, I think we pair programmed remotely even. We, we were completely remote. He was in London and I was in Japan and we paired for almost an entire year, virtually every day. And we use this technique to really help us keep moving forward and to uh, reduce the amount of, of kind of time wastage that w that's quite easy to fall into. So I'm going to show you this technique and how I use it to keep myself organized and keep myself moving forward and keep the momentum high. Now, first, before I do that, I'm going to do a quick introduction to something called the Pomodoro Technique. And the Pomodoro Technique is a time management technique. It's very simple. And basically what you do is you have a timer and, and uh, the person who developed it, he had this kitchen timer, which is a tomato. And um, he used it to time himself, his, his work that he was doing. And he would set the time to 25 minutes and then he would have a five minute break. And so the idea is you just divide up your day into these 30 minute blocks you work for 25 minutes and you take a five minute break. Now there are other parts of the Pomodoro technique um, and you're supposed to make to-do lists and this kind of stuff. So I'm going to show you a little bit about that. I'm not going to show you the original technique. I'm going to show you the way I do it. So having said all that, let's uh, move on to the technique. Now what we're going to do today and for, I'm going to, this is going to be a new series that I'm going to try and do and try and fit in with my other series, which is a bit hard. So I'm going to write a game. And now it's not going to be Uroru Niwa, it's not going to be the game that I'm ultimately writing, but it's kind of a mini game, fun game that I have done in the past. This is slightly different rules and you'll see in fact I've got, this is in my GitHub uh, repository, it's called Beans 2. And this this was actually supposed to be a JavaScript re-implementation of the Beans game, but I never really got around to writing any code. Uh, we're going to do something slightly different this time, but these are the rules of the game. Basically, this is a game that tries to model technical debt. The idea is that choices that you make early on in the game to get quick wins uh, increase the cost later on in the game. But the early wins can be very lucrative, so you need to try and create a balance. And this is one of the things we always have problems as, as programmers, is we, it's difficult to understand the balance. We get a lot of pressure from people saying, release, 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 and release. And on the other hand, we're saying, well, you know what? We also need to look for the long-term sustainability of the code. We need to look at our throughput. How do we maximize throughput? Maybe I need to do some extra tasks, slow down a little bit so I can maintain a consistent speed of development over time. 
And this is what this game tries to model. Now it's a very simple game and you'll see we have three jars. Two of them are empty to begin the game. The other jar contains nine jelly beans. I don't think there are jelly beans in every country in the world, but in, if you don't have jelly beans in your country, um, it's basically just a candy and they're different colors. So I've, I quite like jelly beans. We have nine jelly beans. Three of the jelly beans are red, three are black, and three are green. Now you, the game starts with 15 potential points, all right? And every turn that goes by, the number of potential points decreases by one. So the first turn is 15 points, next turn 14, next turn 13, next turn 12. And the player starts the game without holding any jelly beans. So you have your three jars, all of the jelly beans are in one of the jars. Now you can remove a jelly bean from any jar that contains one. At the beginning, of course, there's only one jar that has jelly beans. And when you remove the jelly bean from a jar, it's in your hand. And so you're holding the jelly bean, all right? Now, taking a jelly bean out of the jar does not take a turn. That's kind of like a half turn. It's a setup. The jars can randomly accept jelly beans. So you can't just put a jelly bean in any jar. You have to put a jelly bean in a jar that is currently open. So the first jar always accepts beans. So it's always open. The second jar is only open 50% of the time. So it's a 50% chance. It's, it's going to be random, actually. It's not always going to be open. And it's not like it's the first turn and it's open, second turn is closed, that kind of thing. It's just that it has a 50% chance of being open. And the third one only has a 25% chance of being open. So it's only 25% chance that you can put a bean in the third jar. Your job really is to kind of distribute the beans. And I'm going to explain how you want to do that. When you have a jelly bean in your hand, you can put the jelly bean in any jar that's open, or you can pass your turn. And if you pass your turn, you continue holding onto the jelly bean, and the next turn you can't pull a new jelly bean out. You have to use that same jelly bean. And that takes a turn. You can force a jelly bean into a jar. So this will simply keep trying until the jelly bean accepts a bean. So let's say you wanted to, you absolutely want to put the jelly bean in the third jar. You only have 25% chance. And so what's going to happen is it'll It'll try third jar, third jar, third jar, third jar, and finally, oh yes, now I can get into the jar. So it'll take like four turns. So how many ever turns until it gets the jelly bean in that jar? And that's just a convenience feature for not wanting to make the user have to do it every time themselves. Now every jar has a point multiplier. And so, like I said, the, the number of potential points are diminishing every turn. So the first turn is 15 points, next turn 14, next turn 13. The point multiplier is calculated by counting the most numerous colored bean and subtracting all of the other beans. Let's start at the beginning actually where we have all the beans in one jar. And so we have three red beans, three black beans, and three green beans. So we can say that we have three red beans, and so that's point multiplier of three, and then we have to subtract all the other beans. So there's six other beans, so we end up with a multiplier of minus three. But in the case that we've moved some beans around, and this is an example where we've already moved some beans around, you can say maybe a jar has three red beans, it has one black bean, and one green bean. And then the point multiplier for the jar is three minus one minus one, so is one. And the point multiplier cannot be less than zero. So when I said that, that the first jar before you move anything, the point multiplier is negative three, that's wrong, it's zero. So it's a little bit complicated, but I, I hope you get the idea. The idea is that you're trying to sort the beans into the jars. So ideally what you really want is you want to have the first jar containing three, say, red beans, second one, three black beans, and the third one, three green beans, and then you'll have the maximum number of points, right? Because you'll have a point multiplier of three in each jar. So anytime a jar has a multiplier of greater than one, it can be released. That's like releasing software. Doing so gives you points, and it's just the number of potential points you have times the point multiplier. And when you do that, it removes the jar from the game and all of the beans that are contained in the jar. And the game is over when the potential points are less than one. So once you get down to zero potential points, or there are no unreleased jars left, or there's only one jar left and it has a point multiplier of zero. And so that's the end of the game. And the idea is to get the most number of points possible. Now, you may look at that and say, okay, that's kind of complicated. And in fact, the original Beans game was even more complicated than that. It was actually really hard to play because it was hard to reason about it. And I'm hoping that this is slightly 
less complicated than the original game. Now the other thing I need to talk about, and I'm, I'm aware that I've actually spoken for quite a bit of time, uh, but the other thing we need to talk about is how we're going to implement this. And I'm going to implement this in a, a programming language called L. But this is a functional language. Uh, it generates JavaScript, and so this will run in the browser. I'm not going to go into all the features and everything about Elm. The reason I'm using Elm is eventually I'm going to write Udo Uruniwa using a functional language. I'm thinking probably it will be pure script, not Elm. But my colleagues at work are looking at Elm for the moment and they're kind of evaluating it for potentially using it in future work. Um, also just as an exercise for learning. And so because I want them to enjoy this video, I thought it might be a good idea to use Elm for doing this short series. So I hope you will enjoy that as well. And I'm not going to explain the features of Elm in this episode. I, I think that in future episodes I will uh, go in and, and potentially we can use this as a, a way of exploring the Elm language. But in this episode, I'm only going to talk about the power Pomodoro techniques. Now, the other thing I need to point out at the beginning is that I do not know Elm. <laughs> so I'm going to use this language. I don't actually know it. I've read some tutorials. I don't think I've actually written any code at all, but I have read, I have read some tutorials and I think I know all of the syntax or I've seen all of the syntax. Now, the thing is that I've actually been looking at PureScript for the last couple of months. And so I actually forget the Elm syntax completely. So this is going to be a situation which I'm in the worst possible case for doing this. And I, this is another reason for choosing Elm language uh, for this Power Pomodoro technique is to show, you know, how do I just get started when I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing? And this is exactly going to be the case. I have exactly no idea what I'm doing. The other thing is I've written almost no functional code before in my career. I've been a professional programmer for something like 30 years, but I have never worked doing functional programming before. So this is completely new to me. It's quite exciting for me and quite fun but you will see me struggling along the way. And I think that's fine. You know, no matter how long you've been doing something or how expert you are in one area, for instance, that there's always another area that you know absolutely nothing about and you're going to struggle. And it's okay. It's okay to show that struggling. And I, part of what I want to do for this uh, video and for this video series is to show me struggling because that's a good thing. Now you'll notice that it's 11 o'clock in the morning. And this is my normal terminal. I'm running something called Tmux, which is, I guess a terminal multiplex is what it stands for. But basically what it means is that I have multiple windows, but it's all text. So it, here's the second window, here's the third window, here's the fourth window where I have some music. And this is the music that I use for my videos. So I've just made a directory here. This is my normal directory and there's absolutely nothing here. So the first thing I'm gonna do actually, I'm gonna go into the third window here and I'm gonna run a program called Emacs. I say, NW means no window because I wanted to run inside my Tmux rather than opening up a graphical window. I'm using VI key bindings in Emacs, which you might find entertaining if you know what that means. But if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. And I'm just going to maybe just say to do dot work. I'm just going to confirm. Now that's get us started. We just have an open file so we can start getting a to do list going. Now the other thing I'm going to do is I need to start a Pomodoro. Now I have a piece of software called Time, T-H-Y-M-E, which is just a, is a very simple Ruby application that starts a timer and shows it in my Tmux window. And that's what I'm going to use for this. It's not actually what I normally use for my, for my Pomodoro timer, but I'm using it uh, now just because you can see it in the video. It's a little bit easier. So I've set it up so that I have five minutes only. Now, like I said before, normal Pomodoro is 25 minutes, but this power Pomodoro is what we're going to do is we're actually going to do five minute Pomodoros and then we're going to have a one minute reflection. And I'm going to explain what that means as we go, because otherwise it's just going to take too long and it'll be too boring. So we will explain as we go. I'm going to start the timer. And if I just say time minus D, hopefully that will start. And you'll see that it now says five minutes. Now the key here is that we only have five minutes. So if I talk like I normally talk, well, we'll get nothing done. And you'll see 10 minutes or 10 seconds are already ticked away. So I really have to get started. And that's why this is kind of a focusing technique. Now, I've gone back to my to-do thing and I apologize if I end up talking nonsense because it's quite difficult to focus and talk at the same time. But I'm just going to quickly, if I 
put this star here, what that does is it gives it a, it's like a bullet point in org mode. Uh, you can use any kind of system that you like in for your to-do list, and this is just how I'm doing mine. And I'm just going to put a to-do here. And the first thing I want to do is I need to, I need to think about what am I going to actually do? How am I going to, how am I going to get started? Because I have nothing, right? And so the first thing I think we need to do probably is to set up Elm. That sounds good, right? Um, let's see what else do we need to do. Um, uh, move the uh, instructions into the project. Write a hello world program in L. And I think that's as far forward as I can see. We spent already, we spent a minute and a half already thinking about this, so we don't have any more time, so we need to get started. Go quickly into here, and what we need to do is we need to figure out how to install Elm. Now, we don't have our timer going, so we don't know how much time we're spending, but let's click on install and see what it says. So, like I said, I don't know what I'm doing, and this is all good. So, it looks like we can use NPM to install it. There's also an installer on Windows and an installer on Mac. I suspect there's also an installer uh, on my system. I may, in fact, already have it installed. Let me just check. Now, I don't have it installed, but I'm using Arch Linux, so I'm just going to quickly see. So you can see Elm is not there. So that's kind of unfortunate. I, I assume it's a an AUR package as well, but that's kind of a pain in the ass. I'm trying not to swear very much on these uh, videos because I'm trying to keep it, trying to keep it family friendly. I think probably the easiest way for us to do this is using NPM. And I do actually have npm installed, which is the npm is a node package manager. I'm not going to talk about how to install that, but uh, here's you can see they've got there. So I'm not going to use this minus g. Never use minus g on npm. They always tell you to use it, but never use it. And I won't explain why right now. But take my advice: never use minus g. Um, sorry, we need to install. So we only have one one minute thirty going here still installing it may use up the rest of our time just fair warning i may edit out things as i'm going so that you don't actually have to sit through all of the work that i'm doing so now we have elm installed and you will notice that there's now a node modules directory i am probably going to use this window for my editor and i'm just going to set it up here um, i want to go here so we've now set up elm which is good i've done that that's actually control c control t you'll see if i press tab here it kind of folds it so you don't see what's in between. So I can actually put some things like do some stuff to set Elm. And now if I, again, if I just press, if I go to here and press tab, it hides it for me and that's useful. Now you may have seen that times up just came up on the screen and that means we are done our first Pomodoro. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to do time minus db, which is a break. That gives me a one minute timer. And this is a time for reflection. What have we done? And what do we want to do? So I have set up Elm and I am also going to need to set up Emacs, set up my editor for Elm. That's something I need to do. This was in our first Pomodoro, so I'm just going to, what I'm going to do actually is I'm just going to say Pomodoro, just so we keep track of what we're doing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I'll just do Alt right there. It just indents that one more. So now when I, again, if I just fold that, it now folds everything inside. So Pomodoro one is done. We managed to set up Elm in our first Pomodoro. That's five minutes. I'm happy with that. I don't think there's anything we need to do differently. So we're making good progress. It's all good. And so now our uh, reflection period is finished. Sometimes it takes a little more than a minute and it's okay if you decide I need more time to reflect. Just take the more time. Um, the idea of this Power Pomodoro is really just to keep you focused and keep you moving and kind of have that time pressure of going, okay, look, you can't waste time, but it's not to stop you from doing what you need to do. So we now have that. Now I'm going to, without the B, B means break. So now I just do time minus D and I'm back to five minutes. So we got our five minutes back again. We're in the Pomodoro 2. I'm just going to 
quickly set up this. Oops, that was already in insert mode. So I can say now Pomodoro 2. And we need to set up our editor for Elm. And I do remember when we looked in here that in fact says configure your editor. And I'm using Emacs. So there is an Emacs Elm mode. Now I suspect that I have actually installed this previously. So what I'm going to do is go back to my Emacs window here. Uh, .emacs .d, and this is init.io. Now this is my setup file for Emacs. If you're using a different editor, it's not going to look like this. I'm a bit strange in that I use a window manager called Xmonad because I wanted to learn Haskell, which is the configuration language for, for Xmonad. And I use Emacs because I wanted to learn Lisp, which is the configuration language for Emacs. And that is literally the reason I'm using Emacs at the moment, is because I just want an excuse to learn Lisp. But I'm just going to search here for Elm, because I do think I, yes, I already have Elm installed. So there's nothing we need to do, and that's excellent. So let's just say we're done. All right, next one is, let's move our instructions into the project. And I think the easiest way for us to do that is probably just cut and paste it. All right, um, I probably will have edited it out, but you'll notice that the time has, uh, has decreased. I had some difficulty actually making this file uh, for reasons that are, trust me, far too stupid for me to spend time talking about, uh, but um, it is rather stupid. <laughs> it's the way I have Emacs set up, and I couldn't actually make that file. Um, so now I can <laughs> do this. <laughs> if I go here, I could probably just tech it out. This is probably just gonna be the easiest way to do it. And here we go, description is good. That's all we actually need. Now be careful about um, copying things like this. This is my own project, and you'll notice that there's a license file there, it's copyright and everything, but I own the copyright, so I can do whatever the heck I want with it. You can't just grab things from other people's project and do whatever the heck you want with it. You have to follow the license or, or that kind of thing, right? So obviously it, uh, it doesn't need to be said, but sometimes it does need to be said because sometimes people really don't understand that kind of stuff. So I just paste that. And there we go. Well, that's good enough for now. I don't really care. All right, so that's done. And we've got 20 seconds left. So now we need to start to write a Hello World program in Elm. And I'm guessing, in fact, that this, I'm just gonna make a up to do, is that there will probably be a tutorial in, I'm just gonna finish this up. There is going to be a tutorial in the on the Elm webpage, which we will plagiarize heavily. I've finished my Pomodoro. I need to now time minus BD, DB, doesn't really matter, BD, DB. Um, so now we have one minute of reflection. So let's have a look at what we've got here. And uh, what I noticed is that uh, we probably need to think a little bit further ahead about what we're doing because we're running our tank on empty. So I'm just going to quickly stick again. We're going to go into Pomodoro, Pomodoro 3. And we haven't actually done any of this here. So once we've got the Hello World program done, just going to close that. Once we've got the Hello World program done, what do we want to do? I think what we were going to want to do then is, let's have a quick look at the description of the game. I'm thinking, so we've got a concept of jars, we've got a concept of points, we've got a concept of hand, and we've got a concept of beans. So I think the first thing I want to do probably is I'm going to start with these points. Now you'll see I've run out of time for my reflection. I think we're going to start with the points and we're just going to find some way of going through the turns and reducing the points by one each turn. Because that's easy to do. So, and again, I've run out of time. I'm supposed to only use the one minute, but I'm just going to, I'm just going to finish up what I'm doing. Display 15 points on the screen. When the user presses a button, I go to the next turn, decrement 
checkpoint when the user presses a button. Now, the one last thing I actually want to do, and I don't know when I'm going to do this, is I would really like to have some tests. So I'm going to go in here and I'm just going to say someday I um, set up test framework. Because I need to actually look for a test framework. So again, I'm just going to quickly do that. Look for an appropriate test framework. And that's good enough. I'm happy with that. I don't need to do any more, any more thinking. So I'm going to just go back straight into my five minute Pomodoro again. We need to find a tutorial on the web page so we can write a hello world program. That sounds good. So, now the Elm architecture has, um, this documentation is very nice actually, because it has um, everything set out here. And I'm just wondering if it shows us what we want to know. And I'm just looking at it very, very quickly. And it, obviously we've got, we've got this kind of set up here um, and that's a basic basic state of how it works but it's not exactly what we're looking for so I really just want to show a hello world and this is using the REPL this is not what we want to do but it's pretty it's good if you want to just play with Elm so what I'm going to do then because we're running out of time like we're already 310 almost two minutes in you, you literally can't spend this much time looking for stuff because it's just too much time. So I'm going to just stop what I'm doing because that's not getting me where I want to go. I'm going to look hello because I'm sure that we have a hello world tutorial somewhere which we can just look at. And look at that. Exactly what we want. Module hello exposing blah blah blah. Import HTML exposing text. Main text hello and I have actually a pretty good idea what this means because I've read tutorials before and I can explain it to you as we go but we're going to need a file oh, we need to also do this elm package install elm lang html so let's do that first so I'm going to actually put this here just so later when I'm looking at I go like how do you do that I'll actually be able to find it because we have to install the html package so let's do that I only got a minute 20 left I'm running out of time. All right, on. This is where you need a deep breath. And I've just realized that I haven't set up my path. Let's just quickly write that down. This is not an important thing. And writing this down is, takes more time than actually doing it. But it's just a good practice to get into so that you remember how to do things. So if I just say export path, equals dollar path colon dot slash node I think it's node dash modules uh, I'll have to look no, it's node underscore modules uh, I should just uh, show you here if you look in as node modules and then there's a directory called dot bin I believe and in that directory there will be all of these elm functions here so we just need to add this to our path and we're out of time our, our Pomodoro is basically up. There it is. Good. I'm just going to just do that install right now. So again, don't worry too much if you go 30 seconds above. And uh, what do I want to install? Is this okay? The core HTML and virtual DOM. That looks good to me. If you don't know what any of that means, don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> but um, now we're back again. We need to go to uh, time minus BD. Right, we've got a one minute of reflection. So we found a tutorial, this is what we wanted. We have made, set up our path, but we haven't actually done everything we want to do for this. So what I'm gonna do actually, so we still wanna do this, I'm just gonna delete this here. So this is now just a heading rather than a to-do. I'm going to grab this. Turn it back into a to do because we still have a little bit more to do on that. Um, and I'm still happy with our plan. Well, I think our plan is going very well at the moment. And uh, we're making good progress. We're not wasting time. So that looks good to me. This is not correct. That has to be there. All right. 
we'll just close that and then we'll close that as well. Ah, again, we need to uh, just need to move that over and close this. And you can see why just having a folding editor like this is really helpful. And an org mode is very helpful because it has these to do things built in. But it's not necessary in any way, to be honest. You could just use any editor and do whatever you want, or a spreadsheet, or whatever you want, really. All right, so now we're on Pomodoro 4, and I'm going to do, I think we're going to do this last Pomodoro, and then I'm going to call it a day, because I think you get the point as to what we're doing. We haven't even written any code yet, but it's fine. It just gives you an idea of, of kind of what we're doing. When we do this next time, what we'll find is that, because we already have these to-dos written out, it'll be very easy for us to continue on with what we're doing. We're at 11.30. Remember we started, it was, I think it was almost exactly half an hour ago. So I'm just gonna do one more Pomodoro. We'll finish that Pomodoro and then that will be the end of today's episode. So we're going to write that Hello World program in Elm, which we have currently here. I may, actually, I was just thinking about this. Just so that we have this here, I'm, what I'm gonna do is, I'll just embed that in here. Um, that way, if we if we ever want to go back to it, for some reason we want to uh, to do that again, we want to remember how we did it, it's very easy for us to go back and look at that. I'm not sure if I need to put this in some kind of directory. It would be nice to have a, like a source directory or something, but let's not bother yet, because we don't need extra complexity at the moment. All right. We're just going to follow, we're going to follow the same conventions that they are. So we're just going to call it hello.elm. We're going to change the name later. To be honest, I'm just going to cut and paste it because why not? Now, generally speaking, I don't really recommend cutting and pasting code. It's a bad idea. I also don't like auto generated like snippets and things like that. I think it's a, I think it's a generally bad idea as a programmer. You should type everything that you're doing. And as much as I hate my, my high school French teacher for saying this over and over again, um, le main souvient. Uh, your hand remembers and it does <laughs> I really hate admitting that because Because I got into a big argument with my French teacher, but after all since we have just a couple of seconds I'm just going to quickly go through here and explain what this means as far as I know and like I said I don't know this language, but What the heck I have I have a vague idea. So module this is basically saying we're going to package together the code that we're doing. We're making a module and that's kind of a package. And the module is called hello. And this exposing just says we're going to allow other people to use our module and we'll have functions. This is a functional programming language after all. We have functions that other people can use. And this dot dot here just means all of them. Any functions that we, that we create can be used from this package. This import imports another package, it's called HTML, and it says exposing. So it says these are the these are things we're going to use. We're going to use a function called text. And then down here, you can see here, we're actually creating a function. It's called main, and the equal sign tells you that we're creating it. And this function runs another function called text uh, with the parameter hello. And that's all there is to it. Now, um, I do notice that um, my L doc uh, is blowing up on Emacs and I'm not quite sure why it's doing that. So one of these days I'll have to look up and figure out why Emacs is yelling at me. Quickly put that in the to-do. We only have a minute 20 left. All right, so that's that. Now the only other thing I want to try and do in this minute 20 or this minute that we have left is I actually want to run this. And you can see here we've got this thing, Elm Reactor, and I think that actually runs the thing we're doing. There we go. And you'll see that um, it's listening on HTTP localhost 8000. And now if I go to my browser, localhost 8000. And there we go. This is now um, a description of the project that we have. And you'll see we have hello.l. Now my understanding is, having seen a video just yesterday, as it turns out on this topic. If I click on this hello.elm, it will compile it for us. Mm -hmm. Wow, it's taking a long time. Ah, there we go. And it outputted hello. And an interesting font too. I wonder if that's the font I selected. So now our time is up and we have managed to do what we wanted. So we've done 
this to do and actually I need this to be indented one more. Um, we've done this to do. The other thing I need to do is I actually want to be able to build, just realized, I want to be able to build a, build an image rather than using the reactor. Now I know what that means, you may not know what that means, but next time when we come here, you can watch me do that and we'll see how it goes. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, brief exploration of the Pomodoro technique and indeed a brief exploration of the Elm language and I hope you'll join me next time when I will write some real code in this language that I do not know. This has been Uroro Niwa, my name is Mike Charlton, I'll see you next time.